Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Exotic Astrology, and we are continuing with Nishi Pandit on medical astrology. If you have not watched the part one, then please go and watch. He had very beautifully explained about Mars and Saturn's conjunction, and he also explained Venus and the recovery of disease and how it depends on Venus. And he also explained about the Lagna Lord and the placements. So now, what do you have for us? Okay, this example is an example of someone who has cerebral palsy, which is a form of paralysis. So it's a nervous system disorder, okay? And of course, so I picked this randomly from the database. Like, again, I don't know these people and I haven't like pre-planned any of this, but so again, we see like in a nervous system chart where there's a nervous system disorder, there's mars saturn conjunction again, right? In Pisces. So... That's why I said before that like Mars Saturn tends to create these difficulties in the nervous system. Now in this case, the sun is also there. So what is that significant? I already explained Mars Saturn significance in the previous video, so I'm not going to say that again. But I am going to introduce like why is the sun here and what is the indication of that? Well, here sun is the Lagna Lord, okay? So very important planet for this person. The sun also, in general, represents a person's vitality. They're Agni, you know, in Ayurveda, we talk about Agni as the life power of the person. And we describe how that Agni is present in many ways. You know, it's present in the divine sense, you know, like all creation proceeds from Agni. We can say that's like a Vedic understanding. We also can see that that Agni lives in our solar plexus region, you know, and that's what Ayurveda calls the digestive fire or Chatar Agni. That's another type of Agni. But then we also say that Agni is present in all of the seven dhatus or seven tissues. And in between each dhatu, there's Agni. You know, that Agni is transforming that dhatu into the next dhatu. So Agni is also everywhere present as the principle of transformation, of, of metabolism. Okay? So that's like the building block of life. Life is very much the pro a vital process, a process of energy, process of fire a process of health and well-being too. So the sun represents the person's kind of core vitality. So if the sun is not doing well, then we know that the person probably is deficient in Agni. They probably have some digestive disorders as a result of that, but they also may struggle at the psychological level with motivation. Okay? Because Agni is the fire that's fueling our lives. If the fire of fueling our life is deficient in any way, then we, we don't move forward. You know? We just remain stagnant. We remain in stasis. So that creative power, you know, the sun is a creative power. So here we have a sun-Saturn conjunction happening. And sun and Saturn are enemies. So we know that that's an issue for this person. We also can see that you know, Sun and Mars are together, so that, that can create a lot of heat for a person. All of this is in Pisces, which is a water Rashi, so it may not be too bad. But already they're Leo Lagna, so they probably have some, some strong Pitta qualities, you could say. Sun is with Mars, so that definitely increases, you know, two fiery planets together, always brings more fire. And Pisces is really, there's some difficulties here. So Pisces also represents the feet. Okay? That's interesting. What is the feet? You know, well, I, there's a lot of ways of looking at it, but the feet is our connection with the earth, you could say. That's one thing. So the feet represents spiritual connection. You know, the feet of the guru is said to be the source of blessing, right? So that's another reason why Pisces has to do with spiritual liberation and why the feet are there. Another thing you could say is that, you know, the feet is what we use to move in life, you know, to stay connected with life and to move forward. You know, if your feet aren't on the ground, you're not going anywhere, right? So here you could see that a person is probably struggling with mobility on some level. So they are struggling with um, deficient fire. So mobility at the psychological level is compromised but it's probably also compromised physically, okay? And that's why we have the indications of cerebral palsy. Okay, so something 
that's supposed to move is not moving. That's the point. Okay? It doesn't necessarily mean that a person can't walk. It just means that something that is supposed to move is now paralyzed. And we can see this paralysis at many levels, as I said before, psychologically as well. And perhaps that's even the primary domain in which it's happening. So Sun-Saturn conjunction, Mars-Saturn conjunction, this person is really suffering with their fire element. And in Pisces, so I explained that, this is the eighth house. You know, the eighth house is the house of Ayus, which is life. Okay? That's the same word that's at the root of Ayurveda, which is a science of life. So life, eighth house represents so many things, as we know. You know, occult things, vulnerabilities, sudden events, death, you know, all kinds of things you can see from the eighth house. Sexuality, basically all that relates to the fundamental process of life, you know, is there in the eighth house. So I consider the eighth house as a very important house for a person's health and a very important house in a person's, you know, the health of their life force altogether, you know, a very fundamental level of their life energy is seen through the eighth house. And if you have all these difficult placements happening there in the eighth house, we can see that their, their core life energy is really struggling. You know, their prana is not very strong. So always the core root of disease is a deficiency in prana. You know, life energy is always deficient in some way. And that's what we're looking at in the chart. We're looking at the different ways that life energy is manifested in terms of planets, what that means in terms of our bodies, you know, because when we're reading the Nadi, we're just, what we're listening for is the life energy, you know, because what moves in the Nadi? Prana. So that's the whole point. And that's what we're looking at here. You know, the Rashi in that sense is like a Nadi, you know, and the planet is the Prana. So we need to feel, you know, like taking the pulse again, that metaphor I'm using, you know, we need to feel what's happening, you know, in these Nadis, what's happening in all these Rashis, what's happening with these planets, how is the prana moving, you know, and where is it not moving? That's the important factor in disease. And that's why the first thing is where it's not moving is Sun, Mars, Saturn conjunction in Pisces, you know, and implicating Lugna Lord and the nervous system. So that's my, that's this example. Um, they also have a Rahu Venus opposition, you know, which is worth noting. Rahu also is in Mars's Rashi. Um, that definitely makes things more difficult. You know, Ketu is with the moon. But the moon also is the mind and the emotions. And I was already saying that there's probably some psychological level to this, you know, where the person is feeling deficient in their inspiration and motivation in life. So moon Ketu will, can give some of that. Um, now maybe they, they can use all these experiences to go in a spiritual direction because they have all these planets in Pisces. They have moon Ketu conjunction. Those people can, you know, often make a lot of use of meditation. So that's also possible. I don't know the story of this person's life, but I can see where the disease is. And Rahu opposite Venus is not going to make, you know, recovery that easy, you know, and Rahu and Venus are both in Mars Rashi's and we can see what Mars is up to. You know, he's having some difficult, Conjunctions, especially by Saturn. So, you know, that's that's pretty much what, what I have to say about this example. What do you think, Babaji? One thing I want to ask is regarding this moon and K2, you said, can you just uh, elaborate on that some more? Sure. So wherever Rahu and Ketu are is going to indicate some imbalance, okay? Now, how a person deals with that is another story. And for that, we have to look at a lot of things, including like lords of Rahu and Ketu. You know, I think especially you have to look at Saturn and Mercury. And you have to see like how many planets, you know, is Rahu moving toward and things like that. So there's a lot of ways to read how well a person is going to deal with the kind of inherent imbalance that Rahu and Ketu represent in life but suffice to say that wherever they are placed there is some kind of imbalance happening the person is struggling to balance those things so ketu in the moon you know shows that a person has you know developed a lot in terms of their mind and emotional character 
you know, psychologically perhaps. But in this life, they're having to release something of that. You know, they're not, they don't have that in this life. They're having to let go of it in some way or develop it at another level, you could say, than the way they have. So there's some imbalance there because they're going to tend to perpetuate it, you know, as a, as a karmic pattern, you know, from a previous life, which is what K2 represents. They'll tend to continue in a mode that's not relevant to their present evolution in this life. So then that becomes a disease factor because their energy is stuck when it's needing to move in a new way. The new way that energy needs to move is what Rahu indicates. And so the Rashi that Rahu is in, the Lord of the Rashi that Rahu is in also has health implications for us because we're going to struggle to use what that planet represents. And that part of our body is not going to have as much energy as the other parts of our body. Okay. So that's why it's important to look at Rahu Ketu in medical, in the medical context. And really that's where mo all the problems are coming from, to be honest, that is the root, you know, of the imbalances is Rahu Ketu. Um, did that answer your question? Yes. So regarding Rahu Ketu, so suppose Rahu Ketu is in a particular sign and in a particular house. So, okay. How, how do you reconcile that? So it's like, suppose Rahu is in Taurus, for example, so in any house, so then you, then do you say that that disease can be something related to the mouth or the face, or suppose it's in the 10th house, for example, or a Leo Lagna, then, I mean, how do you see that the 10th house is the knees, I guess that part can have some problem or, you know, you could say that I tend, I don't tend to use. I don't tend to look at the house in terms of the body as much as I look at the Rashi as the body. Yeah. That's what I was about to ask. Yeah. So you can do that. I personally haven't done much of that to see how accurate is it really, but I get really good results when I take the Rashi as the body. Um, and I just use the house to just see more of where all of this is happening in their life, not necessarily in their body, but in their life. So I see the house as a slightly bigger context. Well, as I see the, the Rashi is really like the body, you know, at all of its dimensions. And also in the Rashi, we get all of the elements, dosha, the gunas. You get all kinds of qualities in the Rashi. And if you start to understand all those qualities, then you understand more about what it means, you know, for certain planets to be in them. So in terms of Rahu Ketu, I would really look more closely at the Rashi. Um, but even then, it's important to understand that Rahu and Ketu are primarily indicating something at a psychological level. Oh. So that may not have a very clear physical manifestation, okay? It'll only have a clear physical manifestation when that imbalance manifests at the physical level. So what we see in Rahu and Ketu is an imbalance that is yet invisible, but very active, okay? And we can look at the other planets and see, you know, where is some physical weaknesses? What are the parts of the body that are not naturally strong? Well, those parts of the body are going to be the host of imbalances. They are, they're the most vulnerable to expressing the imbalance, the weakness, you know? So the imbalance of Rahu and Ketu is going to manifest in those regions of the body that are naturally weak. We're not born like completely perfect. You know, that's human life. So everybody is compromised somewhere and that's usually where they're going to have imbalance relative to those things now why they're having it has everything to do with rahu and ketu so that's yeah, that's how i look at it another thing is like uh, people say that jupiter is the karka for uh, to some extent because it's the karka for expansion so that also aids in cancer sometimes yeah, definitely. You know, and on the one hand, Jupiter is is great benefit. You know, that's never supposed to cause harm. It just helps everything. But on the other hand, if we understand Jupiter just in terms of energy, it's the energy of growth and expansion. So if it's joined with something, you know, whatever that thing is, is going to grow. So certainly, Jupiter can increase the growth of you know cancers, tumors. Absolutely. Because without that, it can't happen. Right. And uh, is, is there anything uh, else by which we can, you know, make a note that this person has the tendency to go into too many addictions or any kind of addictions for that sake? 
Yes, yes, you can. I would look at, I would definitely look at Scorpio as a Rashi. Okay. I see a lot of issues like when Venus is in Scorpio and usually like Saturn, like Saturn and Venus in Scorpio is classic to me, oh, your addiction. And why, why, why do you think that is? I mean, why only these two planets? It's not necessarily that way. You know, I think that you could probably see addiction in a lot of different permutations of the chart. But we have to understand what addiction is. And one of the things that happens in addiction is that a person is relying on a substance to give them something because they are not capable of being rejuvenated by life as it is. They need something, outer stimulation, in order to feel alive, to feel something often. And they feel like this dark hole, you know, they feel emptied of life and they're looking for something to fill that void. And that's how addiction happens. So that relates back to Venus, you know, and Venus also relates to choices. So if, if we have a healthy Venus, we make choices in life that situate us in a circumstance of well-being and health in which we feel rejuvenated by life, nourished by life, right? So if Venus isn't placed well, that's going to be a significant factor in what drives someone toward addiction. They haven't made choices that have allowed them to be nourished by their life circumstances. And secondly, they may have trouble feeling rejuvenated by life, you know? Their life energy may simply be diminished in that regard that they just don't they don't rejuvenate, you know, they just feel drained by life, hurt by life, knocked down by life, struggling to, to stay up, you know, and that's why people, you know, do things like cocaine and heroin or whatever it is, like, they're trying to find a way to fill that void and, and participate in life, you know, but they don't have the inherent energy of it, and life isn't pleasurable for them without drugs. So that's what addiction is, right? That's what Venus is. Venus is pleasure. The people who are looking for pleasure through drugs are having the issues with Venus for sure, you know? So I think Venus is a core planet to look at. And, and Scorpio, I said, because it's kind of a hidden sign. You know? People tend to do secretive, you know, I don't, I don't want to paint the stereotype like Scorpio is a dark sign. That's not necessarily it, but it is hidden. And it's very much interested in underground things, you know, and doing things that are underground, you know? And drugs are underground, you know, like where do you know, what is the stereotype? People like meet drug dealers in alleyways, like dark places, you know, basements, like, you know, these are not places that are like above ground that are visible to people like, and it's something that's happening in a hidden way, secret way. And, you know, Scorpio also represents our strengths and weaknesses in a lot of ways and, and the process of overcoming those weaknesses. But when that process of overcoming those weaknesses is compromised in some way, we fall into our weakness, you know? And addiction is a kind of a weakness. So that's why I'm saying Scorpio is involved, you know? And Saturn is always there, you know, to cause grief in some way, right? So impose a limitation, you know, impose a narrowing of something. The person's consciousness narrows. They think, I can't live without this. That's not true, you know? But they feel that way. That's why they depend on it. That's a constriction of Saturn, you know? They become too much focused on this one thing as the thing. So that's what I, that's uh, so just a basic synopsis. Like, I will get maximum pleasure out from this only. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is the only way I can yeah, exist, yes. you know, and feel good in my life. Okay, so we'll discuss the next part in the, the next section, I guess. Yes. Okay, so stay tuned.